today's conversation, um, you know, when I first spoke with Daniel and Aliyah, I wanted to understand, you know, really what is the spirit of today's discussion for you guys. So I wanted to start with the absolute essentials and explain really what is, what is UX. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of opinions about it. There's a lot of confusion, misunderstanding about it. So we wanted to answer some, some very core questions. What is UX? Is what we're going to cover today. What are the origins of UX? Where does it come from? How is UX done in a very broad level? And then finally, we'll leave some time uh, for some questions and answers. Now, before we get started, I'm going to show you just a little quick um, sizzle reel about what Wrecking Ball does so you get an idea. Sweet. All right. So, Wrecking Ball is, um, you know, it's one, of, it's one of South Florida's top digital agencies. We do just about everything in a digital environment. We build digital experiences and digital products. Um, we're about 25 designers, developers, and content creators. You know, we're wrecking stuff. And part of the name, part of the spirit of where we came up with the name Wrecking Ball is, you know, we're sort of breaking the status quo to start building the future and move forward that way. Um, you know, we have a range of clients from, you know, Adobe and Bacardi and, you know, Charter Spectrum. We've done some really good stuff for some big national and global brands. Um, and we make, like, like I mentioned, you know, from mobile apps, you know, we do lots of huge enterprise uh, platforms. We've done video on demand systems for Time Warner Cable, um, asset management tools, digital publication, multi-touch displays, all kinds of stuff that all require hardcore intense user experience. Something that Aliyah mentioned before that I wanted to touch, touch on as well was, she, when she asked the question about apps, how many of you have downloaded apps and then deleted them after a minute? Now, in those situations, you have the luxury and the liberty of, you know, you're playing around. You're like, hey, let me check this out. I don't like it. I'm going to trash it. What happens if that's a computer system that you, you have to use every single day where you work? It's your banking system. You know, it's, it's, it's your, your, your work in insurance, and this is how you manage claims. That's a different story because now you don't have a choice. You have to interface with the system. Your productivity is affected as a result of good UX or bad UX. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you a little bit about myself and my background before we get started into the, into the rest of the lecture. Um, so I grew up in Miami, grew up down, you know, in Kendall. I actually went... To, uh, to a fantastic high school here in Miami at, uh, in the design district, Design Architecture Senior High. I was studying to be an architect, and then uh, I, hit my, I hit about 17 years old, and I realized you know, that architecture, is my, and I still love architecture, but architecture, you know, I would have, 
had to be in the business for 20, 30 years before you really get to do what you want to do. I mean, architect, I mean, you're talking, you know, millions, billions of dollars to build a brand new, you know, building with, you know, property taxes and, and business rules and all kinds of other things. And for me, the thought of putting all this energy into something that would take a year, year and a half to build, and in the end, it gets whacked down with things that, you know, it isn't what you ultimately wanted it to be, that'd be kind of heartbreaking as a creative person. I wanted something that, that, that I could quickly change and switch, but at the heart of what I loved doing was solving problems. I learned that creative people, when you boil us all down, it doesn't matter whether it's fashion, industrial design, architecture, or advertising, the thing that I loved the most was solving problems. So I got my first job working for an advertising agency three weeks out of high school. It is all I've done for my entire career. 25 years is working in design and marketing. And honestly, I, I, I don't know what else I would do. I, you know, I'm, I'm one of those few people that I love what I do and I do what I love every single day. And, and uh, you know, so I've, I've worked for some of the biggest agencies down here in South Florida. In the last few years, I focused exclusively on working on design for digital experiences. And we're gonna go into some more detail about that today. So, what is UX? Before we get started, give me some volunteers. Give me some ideas. What do you guys think UX is? User experience, User experience. yes, very literally, okay. I mean, give me, give me a, a little bit more. Yes, UX stands for user experience. What, what is user experience? What is the design of user experience? Any, any, any suggestions? Yes. with a certain product. Very good, okay, I like that. Anybody else? Yes? Flow. It's what? Flow. flow. Okay, flow. Any other thoughts? Well, user experience, <coughs> excuse me. User experience refers to the perception of value and the sense of fulfillment one has from interacting with a product, a system, or a service. That's a big definition. It's a, it's a heady thing. We're going to explain a little bit more detail. But remember one thing. It is the perception of value and the sense of fulfillment that you have from interacting with any product, any service, or any system. So by definition, UX is all-inclusive, and it is bound to an organization's purpose, processes, capabilities, people, and identity. What that means is you cannot separate the user experience that you have, with a, with, 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 whether it's a company, whether it's an organization, it doesn't matter. You cannot separate your experience with, with, with that, um, you know, from a company's purpose. So what the company perceives and what they intend to bring to the world, uh, what their business processes are, how they run their business, what their capabilities are, how, how their, their skills at changing and improving their own technologies, their culture. If you're dealing with, um, I mean, I'm sure every single person here has called a customer service, you know, at some point over something, that's part of your experience with that company as well. And then the identity, how that company markets itself, how they brand themselves. All of those things are part of your interaction with a company, and that is part of the user's experience. But the user experience itself, you cannot separate from that, from that process. What are some misconceptions about UX? It is not exclusive to digital. We think about UX in the, in, we think about UX in a digital sense, and it's true. As UX designers, we are working and building on digital products. But user experience, the customer experience, is not exclusive to digital. And I'll give you a few examples. How many of you have ever built IKEA furniture? Right. Now the design of the instructions that went into that. I mean, they basically have to translate across every language. That's why they have no words. It's all pictograms. Um, it is very do-it-yourself, you know, and, and it is done intentionally to make sure that your experience with it is as simple and not confusing as possible. Um, how many of you have ever bought a coffee at Starbucks, right? Now, at Starbucks, you are, you are basically conforming. To, they have created a language. And you, are, you, you have learned to speak their language. When you go in and you order a venti, you know, frappuccino, whatever. You know, like, you, you have adapted, and, and now you are, you, are, you are being a part of their culture, and they've, they, you've conformed to that system. 
and it is something that you want. You align with that brand. It is part of your understanding of the sense of what that company stands for and your relationship with it. How many of you have Comcast? <laughs> and how many of you ever tried to call Comcast to deal with customer service? I'll tell you, I, I, uh, I've had Comcast for years, and trying to navigate through at least their automated service sucks. It sucks bad, and I hate it, and you know what? I don't have a choice, it, but actually, I do have a choice. The choice is, do I stop using Comcast and then pay more, pay less, get better service? Not better, I don't know, because I really can't stand their customer service. I don't, I don't know what the choice is. I still use it, but I'll tell you, it makes it a decision point. Is it something, is it, a, is it part of the relationship I want to continue to have with this organization that obviously doesn't care that much about me that they have such a crappy customer service? How many of you have ever gone to interview for a job? I'm sure everybody has. I mean, the process there as well of, um, you know, when you get to the office and you fill out the forms and you're waiting in line and so forth. More importantly, when you're going to a new doctor, when you're going to a new doctor and they make you fill out pages and pages and pages of forms, like, no one likes to do that. It already puts you in a negative space when you're going into that experience where you're spending the first 30 minutes filling out a bunch of paperwork and it, it's, just, it's just not good. And then finally, when you're purchasing an Apple product, I mean, that's one example of many where, you know, every single touch point along that process in that customer experience has been designed specifically to reinforce your perception of their brand from the packaging, the way that it's open when you turn on the computer, the welcome message, the sounds, every single thing has been done by design to make sure that you value your experience with that product and with that brand. Another misconception about UX, it is not the same as UI. Aliyah mentioned this before as well, UI is designed as the aesthetic layer and UI is a part of UX, but UX is so much more than that. <clears throat> And UX is much more than just a checklist of features, and we'll get into more detail about that. All right, requirements for UX. UX requires a deep understanding of a user's wants and needs, so the emotional layer, their values, their beliefs, their perceptions, their preferences, their expectations, and their abilities, both physical and psychological. A big part of user experience is psychology. I have no degree in psychology, my background's in graphic design, but you are definitely, you have to bring into mind an understanding of people, an understanding of language, an understanding of how people think and how they operate and how, how they function. So what are the goals of UX? When you're making UX, what are you trying to do? Well, good UX has to be considered useful. If it's not useful, it's not good UX. It's got to be meaningful and valuable. I, I have a need, and I am going to interface with your system, with your, whether it's customer service, whether it's a website, whether it's an app, it doesn't matter. I'm going to interface with you as the company, and I, I want to satisfy what my need is at that moment. It's got to be usable. It, it, may, it may solve my problem, but if it was a major pain in the butt to do it, that, that also affects my psychology, my perception about your brand. It's got to be desirable, and you know, UI is definitely a part of this, but it has to be interesting and it has to be appealing. I was, I mean, one of my best friends growing up was, was very much into, um, into, into those bulletin board, the BB, BB edit forms and stuff like that, like, you know, the aesthetic for those old bulletin boards was not pretty. It was very useful. You know, and people loved it because, because they got to communicate with a lot of people back in the 90s, which is amazing. But, um, but yeah, but it, but it was not pretty. And it definitely doesn't invite additional participation. <clears throat> it has to be accessible. It has to serve people with a range of limitations and disabilities. If it can't, then if it's only serving a small select group, it's not good UX. And finally, it has to be credible. In the end, it has to generate a sense of confidence and trust. I mean, I'm sure all of you had, have accidentally clicked on a link that opened up a window or a tab to something that just like, it just smelled fishy. It looked wrong. Like, and that's part of the UX. Sometimes the UX is done like that by design, oddly enough, but in the end, to make it good UX, you wanna believe it. You wanna, you wanna have a sense that it is credible. 
that I trust this. All right, origins of UX. So user experience, like, you know, I could sit here and I could tell you that the origins of UX start in a digital sense. They don't. They are much, much, much older than that. Um, and they really, UX starts, like the root of UX starts in communication. So what is communication? Communication is the act of conveying intended meanings from one entity or group to another through the use of mutually understood signs and semiotic rules. I didn't know what semiotic rules was before I read this, but uh, before, before I wrote this, but um, semiotics is basically the study of signs and sign processes. So things like likeness, analogy, metaphor, symbolism. But when it comes to UX design, everything that you're doing is you're creating signals to communicate meaning and value to people that are interfacing with, 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 with you and with your company, with your brand. And we'll get into this right now in a little bit more detail. So, good example. Who can tell me what this icon represents? It's, it's what? Right, it's, it's, a save, it's a save icon, right? All right, now, how many of you guys have actually ever used a floppy disk to save your files? Get out of here. I don't know. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> Some of you, maybe. <laughs> but think about that. Like, fast forward 10, you know, fast forward 10, 15 years from now, like, that's irrelevant to your average millennial. No one under the age of 25, 20 years old, has ever used the floppy disk. So to continue to use this icon as the save is going to lose meaning. Just like, does anybody know what this means? Yeah, I have no idea what it means because I don't speak hieroglyphics. And that's why, like, you, you, you lose context, you know, for symbolism and for symbols after a period of time. You have to have some relationship to that. Anybody know what this is? And it's funny because there are three red shapes. I mean, there, there are three circle shapes. But no, we know that the relationship specifically between red, yellow, and green implies traffic lights. It implies you know, traffic control, stop, slow down, or in my case, hurry up, and, uh, and go, right? And last one. Oh, sorry. There we go. Both of these are buttons. Who can tell me what the button on the left means? That's right. And the one on the right means enabled. How do you know that? We've established a, sort, a pattern of understanding, a language by which we understand through user experience what these simple symbols and signs represent. All right, so I'm gonna take this back on here. So let's start back in like a little bit of a little bit of ancient history here. All right. So, you know, basically back from like ancient times, the effort of human beings to establish a sense of who they are, to express symbols and meaning to one another and to others, currently and in the future. All right. This is from 15, 17 to 15,000 years before Christ. There. Now. 10, 12, 13,000 years later, we now get cuneiform. Now this, this is the first attempt to create a written language. Now you're doing this on clay tablets, wet clay tablets, which it's cool when you're sitting there and you're writing down things, but you can't carry a whole bunch of these with you, right? So that, that's kind of hard, but the first, I mean, this was really done at the time for accounting and, and, and things like trade and so forth, but this is the first time we saw a written language. What's that? There's <laughs> no delete button, that's right. <laughs> Once you commit it, you're done. From there, we went and we got portable writing. Now we're writing on scrolls, right? And now I can actually take a whole bunch of these. I can build a library, you know? And, and so, so the ability to take the information and move it <clears throat> over large spaces. Illuminated manuscripts. Now from here, you fast forward, you know, probably about a thousand years. 
Now here you've got writing, it is still portable, all right, but now you, there's a sense of adding appeal to it, desirability. Still at this time, most human, most, most human beings, they could not read. I mean, this was being done by monks in dark, you know, in, 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 in dark monasteries for a select group of people that could read it all, okay? Now, the first major step forward in technology for communication was the development of the printing press. Now with the printing press, we can make books and we can print them and we can, and we can share them and now we can spread the ability to read. In the Renaissance, I mean, imagine, now these, obviously, Michelangelo's paintings didn't have words, but can you imagine for any average person looking up the meaning that's conveyed in these symbols? Like, I mean, for some people, I'm sure it was terrifying, you know, to see. You know, it's like, it, here's God everywhere, and, you know, but, but the stories that are woven into all of these symbols, intricate symbols. Now here, fast forward, another step forward, around the same time as the Renaissance, you've got the Reformation. You've got printing, but now printing, instead of big, thick books, they're printing flyers, announcements, these things that they're hammering up in front of doors. I mean, it created a revolution. There was a riot, but here, the ability to spread information very quickly is changing. This, the, the amount of time reduced, the amount of space increased. Now you get into the 16th century, you get into newspapers. Now I'm printing every single day, new information every single day. So, I mean, I mean think, of, think of the level of, of, of intelligence that, that we are en enabling ourselves, the access to information, the growth that we have. And then finally, in the 19th century, we invent photography. Now we can capture photographic evidence, pictures, to work together with words to represent these moments, these experiences, very powerful stuff. And then if you notice one thing here, like now in the last 100, 200 years, the pace of technology has changed and increased and exponentially reduced in time, where now every 10, 20, 30 years, you've got sound recordings, movies, radio broadcasting, television, the, the, the speed at which we can share information now worldwide, and finally, yes, um, the internet, personal computing, now to where we are today with mobile devices and the expansion of this. I mean, the power of this, we used to write on clay tablets, you know, and now we have access to a world of information in our hands. So the, 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 the need and the importance of making access to that information useful, usable, desirable, all the things that we discussed before is tremendously imperative. So communication is really, it, it breaks down to this. Let me unplug this. So communication is, this is, this is a, a model of communication and, and it, is, it is a part of what, it, of what we do every single day as UX designers. So on one hand over here, this is broken up into two sections. You have encoding and decoding. The sender, so be it the company or whatever, the organization that is putting the information out, their communication skills, their attitudes, their knowledge, their social systems, their culture, that is what is, imagine, that is the source of the information that we are coming up with. And then we are taking that and we're converting it into content with certain elements, with certain treatments, certain structure and codes. Now at this point, that is how we have crafted the message. But now you're the receivers. And as the receivers, believe it or not, we have no guarantee that you're going to interpret the information we shared with you the way we intended it. We have to, I mean, it's got to be more than hope. You've got to use analytics and you've got to use things to try to narrow the gap down as much as possible. But think about that. Millions of people, I'm trying to put out a message about my service, about my product, about my website, about whatever the case is, and I've got to make sure that I communicate that so it's understood by as many different people as possible with a range of limitations and, you know, uh, you know physical uh, abilities, psychological abilities, whatever the case is. And then on the receiving side, they're using their five senses between hearing, seeing, touching, tasting, feeling, 
don't taste your computers. They don't taste very good. Um, and then they are using their own skill sets to go and decode that information. Every single day, from every, when we looked at it before, every, every button, every color, the way the page is structured, everything is built based on how we are controlling communication. So the conclusion is, as UX designers, you are creating the structure, the language, the behavior patterns, and the information flows to express meaningful value between two entities. Sure, you are designing, in many cases, you are designing websites, you are designing mobile apps, you are designing you know, all kinds of interesting digital experiences. But you are basically writing language. And a language that is connecting two different groups together so that they understand one another and meaning, there, is, there is meaningful value that is, that is making that connection and hopefully keeping it going, keeping it lasting. For example, you know, um, I'll, use, I'll use an example, it's not a digital sense, but I'm sure everyone here has shopped at a Walmart and has probably also shopped at a Target. Now, Walmart, you know, you're going to get better value, but the experience of shopping at Walmart is, you know, it's pretty much as do it yourself, do what you got to do. Target, the overall architecture of the space, customer service, the, you know, the entire design of the space is intended. You're going to pay a little bit more, but you're going to enjoy the experience as well. So there's, there, there, there's a give or take there. You, and everything, especially, <clears throat> you know, when, when it comes to digital products, it is that language that you are crafting. So it's not just about being an artist, being a designer. You are writing <coughs> systems and structures and language. Oh. So third chapter is how is UX done? So to me, UX breaks down into three different parts. Okay. There is the discover phase. Now discover there, I have it personified as kind of Sherlock Holmes because that's what it is. It's really, you are on the hunt for as much information as possible, okay? Second part there, call it all, all kinds of different things, devise, the strategist, you know, I thought, I, I thought Queen Cersei was a perfect example here because it is about connecting the dots. It is about once you have the context, once you have the information, what are the conclusions that you're coming up from that? And then finally, it's the design phase where now that you have, you, now that you've searched for the facts, you've come up with a conclusion about what you're going to do with the facts, now you're going to make something with it, okay? One of, a UX, one of the UX designer's most powerful tools is curiosity. I can tell you from personal experience, every single day, more than my skills in, you know, Sketch or any of the other programs, the thing that I think helps distinguish me among a lot of my colleagues is the fact that you, just having an unquenchable thirst for um, knowledge, for, 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 bless you, <clears throat> excuse me. You know, when I'm working on projects and stuff, you know, there's always a hunger to know, can this be done better? Can this be done simpler? Is something missing? And you, you have to try to look at all aspects. In fact, you know, it's, it, I think it's better to try to spend some of the time slowing down and focusing because, you know, it's very easy to get carried away. But I'll tell you, curiosity definitely helps um, fuel a UX designer's uh, path. So there are four major parts that you need to understand whenever you're dealing with coming up with UX. So business, whether it's a business or whether it's an organization, a nonprofit, it doesn't matter. Okay, so I'm going to refer to it as a business. But there are four major parts that you need to understand in this relationship when designing UX. So the first one, which is the business, okay, oop, sorry. These are some examples of the kinds of questions that I ask when I'm doing a discovery um, you know, for a business. So one, what is the purpose of the business? Why do you do what you do? What are the products or services that you sell and why do people consider them valuable? I mean, you could tell me in marketing speak why it's supposed to be valuable. Why is it really valuable? How does your business work? I have to know that as a UX designer, because I have to, you know, as a UX designer, we, we have to supplement and enhance and optimize their business processes. So we need to know how your business works. 
What are the main challenges you face <clears throat> internally and externally? I will tell you right now, very often as UX designers, good ones, you're going to be asking questions that will make companies feel slightly uncomfortable. They may not want to answer them because it may make them feel like they look bad. You need to see things 360 degrees. You need to understand the good and the bad because your job is to help fix it, improve it, make it better. What improvements have you attempted? What succeeded? What's failed? You've tried stuff before to make it better. Well, did it work? If it didn't work, why didn't it work? As much information as you can get. What are the short and long-term opportunities? How have you been taking advantage? Have you just been sitting on the sidelines while competitors are coming in, sweeping in, or what are you doing to help your business grow? <clears throat> and finally, I mean, and there's many more questions, so these are just some examples. What is the company's vision? If we did our job right, what does success look like? I always want to understand, in the end, what I have finished doing, like, you know, what is the best case scenario, what they imagine that to be. Now, that's on the business end. The next part here is in the market. Now that I have a little bit better understanding of the business, now I need to understand the space that they exist in. Okay? So understanding the market space and the players is critical. Who are your competitors? How do they perform better than you? How do you perform better than them? What advantages or disadvantages do they have? Maybe they have tons of money. Maybe they have 10 times more locations. Maybe they have a superstar CEO. I have no idea. But it's, it's, it's very useful to know. What advantages, disadvantages do you have? What is the current state of the industry? Is the industry growing? Is it contracting? Is it fundamentally changing because of the introduction of new technology? There's all different kinds of things. <clears throat> Who sets the standard? Who is, who is basically the top dog in the space? You know, because th that is what customers believe the process or the industry should look like or work like, so that gives us more context. Where is the industry trending? And finally, are there any substitutes for your product or service? So it may not be that there's direct competitors, but maybe people are using something as a substitute. The third part here is understanding the company's brand. Very important, especially for me, I'm a little biased because I come from marketing and design, but I would tell you as a UX designer, I use this every single day in every project that I do. When I'm designing user experiences, I am not just designing things from a workflow perspective, managing the informa information perspective. I have to become an extension of the company's brand. I am creating the language by which you, who are going to come to this company's website, use this company's mobile apps, use their customer service, the first impression that you're going to have, probably the, most, the primary impression you're going to have with that organization. <clears throat> so I want to understand, what is your brand's personality? Are you trying to express that we're trustworthy, that we're confident, maybe that we're provocative or clever or youthful, luxurious? I have no idea. Whatever that is, I want to try to express that in the experience itself as well. How do you want customers to feel about you? Believe it or not, most companies don't care. No, I don't want to say, no, I think about it. Not that they, most companies don't care. A lot of companies don't care. Many more companies are starting to care now because they understand how valuable design is competitively. I mean, not just because design is beautiful, you know, but, you know, but also it is profitable. And very often that's what makes, convinces most people to take action. Um, so very important, and I always ask this question, is not just how do your customers feel about you, but how do, how do they actually feel about you? So, so you ask a CEO, you ask the head of the company what it is that, you know, how do you want your customers to feel about you? And they will tell you this is, a, but the truth is that there's, often, there's very often there's a lot of complaints, you know, misunderstandings, whatever the case is. <clears throat> what are your strengths and weaknesses of the brand and what brands inspire you? I want to know who you think, who, who are the best brands, who are the brands you respect? That says a lot to me about your aspirations and your perspective on things. And then finally about the users. So when I'm trying to do a discovery about users and to develop, develop user profiles, I try to aim for about 80 to 
of their total users. Now, the reason for that is you're going to have a set of fringe customers, exceptions. And you need to be mindful of the exceptions, but you cannot design to every exception. If you can cover 80 to 85% of the customer base, you're doing very, very well. And then you can work over time to close that gap a little bit more. You will never, and you will be burning your, you will be spinning your wheels to try to, to try to be everything to everyone. It is not possible. So the first question in the space is, are you B2B or are you B2C? Does everybody know what B2B, B2C means? So, so, okay, so are you business to business or direct to consumer? What do your customers want? What do your customers need? Where are they searching today for those solutions? And what expectations do they have when they, when they, when they, when they interact with you, when they, when they are searching to find a solution for their problem? And what are their biggest pain points today? So the essence of strategy is choosing what not to do. So now that you've gathered all this information, really what you have is this. On one side, you've got the business, and you've got some, some material. You have an un some understanding on their business operations, or what are their goals, who are their competitors, what is their customer service like, their culture. You know, you might have a great company, but if you find out that their people hate working there, then you know, you, you'll start to find out, it was like, okay, you know, their customer service might be a challenge. All, uh, again, all of that feeds into, may, maybe I'll do live chat, you know, instead of like, you know, call, whatever. Uh, their branding and marketing, their capabilities and so forth. And on the other side, you've got your users, you've got your customers, and better, a better understanding of their wants, their needs, their values and so forth. And you are creating this, the connection, the bridge, the language, that helps those two entities communicate with each other. So in the next few slides here, these are some examples of things that we've done at Wrecking Ball on some projects. They're, they're not related to each other necessarily. <clears throat> but when I've asked the questions about branding, okay, in this example here, you'll see, I try to come up with five, six different terms, words, that we can use as benchmarks to measure the work that we're doing that it meets these things. So in this case with this client, they want it to be perceived as being high tech, as being impartial and objective, as being based in science, being credible, innovative, that they level the playing field. So everything that we were doing, we were going to make sure was going to express this, communicate this, whether it's in language, whether it's visual, whether it's in imagery and photography and the videos, and it doesn't matter. We wanted to make sure that it felt impartial, fair, equalizing. This next slide here shows, you know, again, we gather their list of competitors and, their, and, and, and various substitutes, and then we analyze those sites, those experiences, see what those things are doing well, where we're doing better, whatever the case is. So context is the most important, I, I can tell you, as, as a UX designer, context is essential. I could not do my work without having adequate context. This next slide here, uh, that sucks. Okay, that was the one font I didn't give Daniel. My apologies. So here what we're doing, now this is an important chart. This is called the engagement pathway. So what this does is this helps me understand, we start with these, there's four areas. Triggers, reach, engage, and loyalty. So triggers, people have needs. Okay, what are they? Well, they're looking to save time and effort, or they're looking for to minimize risks, or they're looking for something, whatever. Triggers, what does the audience desire? The next column here shows where are they looking to fix, where are they looking to satisfy that desire? So they may be going to search on Google, they may be looking for it on YouTube, they might be going to industry events, they might be going to professional organizations, a trade publication. It, it varies completely by industry and by business. But then, so, so where can the audience be found? How am I gonna be able to communicate with them? Once they land on my website, or they experience my app, or they contact customer service, whatever, what are the messages that I'm communicating that give me credibility 
that engender trust and are going to get you to do business with me. So in this case, what valuable assets do I have to offer? What are the messages that are going to convince you that I am legit? And then finally, loyalty is once I've got you, how do I keep you? Right? So, so this might be what convinced you to start doing business with me, but I can promise you it's going to be different than what it's going to take to keep you doing business with me. This entire pathway here is very important to understand. User personas, I'm sure you've all heard of them. We all do them slightly differently. This is just one example of the ones that we do here. Um, you know, we try to come up with, like, you know, yeah, you know, we'll take some pictures off, of, you know, off the web or whatever the case is, but we're trying to come up with a real persona. I want, I want, to, I want to have someone that I can connect with emotionally. <clears throat> so here's Destiny. I don't know if her name's Destiny, but I thought it was cool. You know, she, she, you know, she's a high potential candidate, and I try to, you know, we try to come up with a very specific sense of who Destiny is, you know, um, you know, what her goals are, what her motivations are, what her background is, what are her wants and what are her needs, because we're going to be measuring our work against, against the fact, does, does it convince Destiny to do business with us? And we do f four, five, six of these very often. We try to cover 80 to 85% of, uh, of the customers. And then just to wrap here, uh, this is just some examples. Once we've got all this information, now we start blocking things out. Now we start putting things, the areas, sensible areas of like information where, where these things can group together. This is an essential part. It's, you know, it looks like site mapping, but this is an essential part of the work that we do as UX designers is, you know, once we've, once we've, we've roughly mapped through the area, now I need to start to put it all together in these what we call, you know, mind maps. Um, you know, but this can be done, not this is not just for site mapping a website, this is for processes. One process leads to another, so everything is consequential, and, and I'll definitely mention that in just a minute. Design is fundamentally about problem solving. Aliyah said that before, it was in the Design Disruptors video. That is 100% exactly what design is. Design is intentionally trying to accomplish something. There is a challenge. It doesn't necessarily have to be a problem. There is a challenge that it must be resolved. We are designing the solution, the language for those solutions. So just to wrap up, um, here's a few tips. Um, in terms of the tools that we use as UX designers, this, this is my toolbox every single day, every single week. I primarily use um, Sketch. I'm starting to play with uh, Envision Studio, but I have not really had a lot of experience with that yet but envision for prototyping every single day. I don't think I've logged out in three and a half years. Envision, envision. Um, I'll tell you this tool, if you haven't heard of it before, as a UX designer, you should check it out. It's called MindNode, MindNode. It is outstanding. I use it for, it is very quick, very simple, and I use it for mapping out my ideas. I still use Photoshop and Illustrator, surprisingly enough. I, I never thought I wouldn't use them. I definitely don't use them as much now, um, but I still do. Material, very helpful. And then more productivity things, I use Slack, Keynote uh, for my presentations in general with clients. I use Atom for some simple uh, web dev stuff, Trello, Annotate for screenshots and write font. This is, my, this is my daily toolbox as a UX designer. All right, some final things here just before we close. So pro tips. As UX designers, number one, you may not know this now, and as you're learning, you will definitely figure this out, but over time, you need to be able to scale quickly. The larger the systems that you get to work on, you have to move very fast. And the way to do that is you have to, you have to um, set certain rules and follow those rules. Now, you don't, have to set, you don't have to follow other people's rules, but you have to follow your own at least. So what I mean by that is start early. Define what your grids are. Define the type rules, your colors, your elements. Once you set those rules, you don't have to, you don't have to keep rethinking about them. You can just use them, scale, and start moving very quickly. Um, math is, I think I actually had this, yes, okay. Um, I don't think, I, I don't know how many UX designers would agree with me on this, but I will tell you, I, we at Wrecking Ball, we don't, we don't really work on low fidelity mockups. 
you know, or we, or, or what, we don't really work on wireframes. Like, we go straight to high fidelity comps, and we want to do it with real, real text, real copy, real images, as much as possible. I want to put myself in the space of how the user is going to feel it, going to experience it, and from there, that's going to give me much better context as to whether we're doing the right job. <clears throat> this is important, and it, early on in your experience, in your career, less so, but over time, it's a critical choice. Do I give clients what they want, or do I give clients what they need? They are not always the same thing. And it's difficult because when you're, when you're a professional problem solver, try to solve that problem. It's like they're paying you, but you're, you really want to make a difference on their business, and what they're asking for is going to hurt them, you know, or is not going to make as much of a difference as what you really believe will. Never lose sight of the goal and defend the choices that you make. If you, ca if you don't have confidence in the choices you've made as a designer, no one else is. And, you know, if you are a professional problem solver, you need to have confidence in how you're solving those problems. Be mindful of developers. They're going to build your stuff. And so, like, if you, you know, so I, I'll tell you, most of the developers that I work with definitely value and appreciate the files that I work on because I try to keep it as organized, as simple as possible for them to build. If they've got to deconstruct what I'm doing, you know, it's, it's never going to end up the way I intended it. And so I want to keep a good relationship with my developing partners. Be quick and adaptable. Math is your ally. Um, you guys would have no idea, but Joey, who was in the audience, he knows. For the last few months, on every single design that I've done, every single thing on every single page is divisible by the number four because I'm freaky like that. I mean, literally, like, every, 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 every font, line height, space, spacing, every, everything. But for me, that's e what it does is it makes it easier for me to scale quickly in the work that I'm doing. Uh, it's, it's predictable. And that predictability gives me confidence and gives me speed. Um, I give this advice whenever I do talks at Ironhack, and that is take an existing website. If you're just practicing, take YouTube. If you've got Sketch, take YouTube. Try to recreate a page on YouTube at home just for fun. I, I would find that fun, but maybe, but I'll tell you this, like as a UX designer, as a UX designer, like I promise you, you will start to learn why that was done this way, why these colors were used, why the spacing here, why, what are the variations that you will learn very quickly by doing things like that. And then finally, keep in mind, what are the experiences of the future going to be like? Not everything will always be visual. You've got things like Alexa now and Echo where there are voice interactive um, user experiences. There's, you know, there's all different kinds of technologies that you need to be mindful of. And that is it. It's only good work if it works. <laughs>